our great heavenly Father, thank you for your son Jesus. And thank you that we can sing a song like that no matter what. Father, as we come to the end of a, of a year and the beginning of a new one, Lord, we know that you exist outside of time, that you have created time. Time is a marker for us, and it's part of your grace in our lives. We can mark seasons, seasons of change, seasons of renewal. And Father, some of us feel like we really need a season of change and renewal. Some of us have had very difficult years, and some of us will have a very difficult year to come. But Lord, even though we live in a fallen and broken world where time marches on and things do tend to unravel, we have hope that the God who exists outside of time has entered into it. You came. You lived among us. You died for our sins. You rose again and you ascended Lord Jesus, where you now advocate for us, you pray for us, and you've given us hopeful confidence that on the day when our lives finally end, it's just the beginning. We have hope eternal. You are going to make everything new. So all glory be to Christ. Thank you for your love and your grace in our lives. Thank you for this confident hope that we have. And gird us up in it. May we have the mind that John Newton had when he penned Amazing Grace. That, that, that we would be uh, forever fortified with these truths. That you are God. That you are on your throne. And that our lives are in your perfect, loving hands. As we open your word now, would you continue to encourage us with those same truths? We pray that in the name that is to be gloried above all names, Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Amen. If you would grab your Bible, you might remember that we were actually studying the book of Philippians before we got into the Advent season. And we still have a couple of Philippians messages left. So if you'd open to Philippians chapter 4, we're actually going to look at a passage that we looked at just before we took the Advent break. Philippians chapter 4. If you're using the Pew Bible, by the way, you'll find that on page 1166. And I'm just going to read a couple of verses this morning. Chapter 4, verse 6. The apostle here says, The Lord is at hand. Do not be anxious about anything. But in everything, by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God, and the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. I mentioned that we looked at this text in November, and I said at the time that this these very familiar verses were actually written in a context where Paul is talking about conflict in the church. So he's reminding the church that in the midst of, of conflict with, with other people, conflict within the church, let your requests be made known to God. Look to him to bring peace in those situations. That, that's what this verse is really about. But it's also appropriate to take verses and build on application and to draw other applications from them. And I wanted to draw an application from these verses as we think about what it means to start a new year. And I want to ask you this question. How many of you feel like you have something to worry about in the new year? 
and I'm not going to ask you to show hands, but if I did, I would think most of our hands would go up. And if we're, our hands weren't going up, I'd question whether we were being honest this morning, right? How many of you have something to worry about in the new year? We like to worry, don't we? I think worrying is, uh, is as American as, as football, apple pie, and Chevrolet, right? It's just something that we all tend to do. And we all have a lot we could worry about, don't we? We live in a complicated world, and we have complicated lives. And it's gotten even more complicated in recent years. I was thinking about when I was a kid, my world really was no bigger than the area in which I could ride my bicycle. That's all I knew. And so I was a generally pretty happy kid because, you know, I can only go so far. There's only so many things I was exposed to. And many of you had childhoods like that, too. And you sometimes longed to go back to those days, right? All you had to worry about was being home before the lights came on. But it's not like that anymore. Even for kids, we live in this world where we've got 24-hour news channels, we've got social media, internet connections that are in our pockets, which is to say that they're usually in our hands, right? And we're just constantly being fed information, most of it geared to scare you and make you worry about something. We're just constantly being fed always, always, always things we ought to be worried about. So what do we worry about? Well, we worry about our finances. We worry about our safety. We worry about the environment. We worry about politics. We worry about our health. We worry about relationships. We worry about career ambitions, our children's development, our aging parents. Do I need to go on? Well, I suppose I should go on, because that's just scratching the surface of all the things we could worry about. I might have problems in my marriage, problems in my family. My car is broken down. My upcoming exam at school is way above my intellect. There's too much competition among my colleagues at work. I wonder if people really like me. I wonder if people really love me. I'll stop there. We have a lot to worry about. We have a lot to worry about. And sometimes we can even read a passage like this one in Philippians 4 that tells you, don't be anxious about anything. And suddenly, what do you do? You start worrying about not worrying. (laughs) So here's the question. Is it foolishly naive for us to believe that we can actually overcome our worries? Is it just sort of sticking our head in the sand And just saying, well, we're just going to deny worries if we just simply believe that we can avoid them somehow? Can we really avoid being anxious about everything, Paul? It's not foolish to believe that. And there's a reason it's not foolish, because God's word here doesn't just tell us not to be anxious about anything, anything, by the way. But it also tells us how we can do this. And so I want to just give you one idea this morning from this text. How do you live out what Paul is encouraging us here to not be anxious? I think it's this. We have to overcome our anxieties through a truth-driven prayerfulness. That's what he's leading us to do. To pray. Truth-driven prayerfulness. I'll explain what I mean by that. Let me read the verses again. The Lord is at hand. Do not be anxious about anything. But in everything, by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God. It's interesting how sometimes if you read verses, especially familiar verses, if, if, you, if you just sort of stop and, and slow down and change the emphasis of certain words or change the tone, it, it, it can take on a little bit more clear meaning. I'm going to do it one more time. Just hear the emphases here. The Lord is at hand. Don't be anxious about anything. But in everything by prayer 
and supplication with thanksgiving. Let your requests be made known to God. What causes me to worry? Isn't worry really just an admission that there's stuff that I can't control? And if that's what worrying is really about, then doesn't it make sense then to take those things that I can't control and lay them at the feet and in the hands of the one who's in control of everything? That's what Paul is encouraging us to do. I'm powerless to control something. That's why I worry, by the way, about the economy. I'm powerless to control it. That's why I worry about my health. I can't stop it from failing me. I'm at the mercy of others when it does to help get me through it. I worry about relationships because in relationships involve what? Other people. And I can't control other people. And I can control how they feel about me. So Paul says, take your anxious thoughts to God. This is not foolish. This is not pie in the sky wishful thinking. Instead, it's obvious. If you can't control the events of your life, take them to the one who controls everything. Now I'm seeing you nod your heads and I expected that you would. When I say something like that, we can all nod our heads and say, yes, we believe that. Yes, that makes sense to us. But can we actually say that we do that? That we actually practice that? Yes, I take everything to the Lord. I trust in the one who controls everything. Do we actually do that? D.A. Carson put it this way, he said, time and time alone and quiet before God is what we need. But our lives are so rushed that we begrudge a three-minute quiet time and then we wonder where God is. That seems to be an experience I can relate to and I think a lot of us can relate to. When was the last time you really prayed about the things that worry you? Did you name them specifically before God? Did you ask him to bear those burdens for you? Why do we fail to do that? I, I think we fail to do that. And again, I'm, I'm just speaking as a human being. I think you can relate to this. I think we do that because we doubt the power of prayer. We doubt that God really will answer prayers, that God's even that concerned about the things that we bring before him. But I want you to consider this, to come before God in regular times of prayer is something that's, that's rooted in promises that he makes to us in his word about his dependability and about his desire for us to do just that. Psalm 91, verse 1 through 2 says this, He who dwells in the shelter of the Most High will abide in the shadow of the Almighty. When we come into his presence, into his court, into his shelter, we will abide in his shadow. I will say to the Lord, my refuge and my fortress my God in whom I trust. 1 Peter 5, cast all your anxieties on him. Why? Because he cares for you. Romans 8, we know that for those who love God, all things work together for good. For those who are called according to his purpose. Scripture is full of promises that God makes to his people. And his desire is for us to trust in them. According to Paul here in Philippians 4, the way to be anxious about nothing is to be prayerful about everything. God is in control. 
and God can be trusted to direct the details of our lives because he loves us and because he wants the best for us. Do you believe that? Does that mean that we're going to escape the pressures of everyday life? No. In fact, nothing could be further from the truth. We're also told that we're going to face all kinds of pressures in everyday life. But it's in those moments, those precise moments, the context of those pressures that we learn to turn to God. We learn to depend on God and we learn to rest in him. Paul's not denying the reality of anxieties here. He tells us what to do with them. And again, he says, lay them at the feet of the Lord. Bring them to the sovereign God who's in control and admit to him that we need his strength and we need his grace in our time of need. So are you convinced yet? Y'all ready to go out and Make 2023 the most prayerful year of your lives? Maybe. Kind of. I mean, I know I should be, but I still have some doubts. Because it never seems to work for me. You feel that way? Never seems to work for me. I admit, I've certainly felt that way. I mean, we've all felt that way. There are times in our lives when things go badly. Circumstances go awry, and, and, we, and we make prayer requests to God like this. We say, God, change this, right? This is not what I hoped for. This is not the way it should be going. Change this. And it's in those times that often we find nothing happens, right? The economic pressure doesn't brighten. The, the relationship doesn't pan out. The circumstances don't change. So what am I missing? I had a conversation with a church member this week who was talking about praying with a child in their family and they were praying about something very important and very specific and it, at least in their estimation, God didn't answer that prayer. And the child asked the question that most children will ask, why didn't God answer that prayer? What do you say? How do you feel? What are we missing? Probably what we're missing are two very important words that Paul uses here. Look again at verse 6. He tells us not to be anxious about anything, but in everything in prayer with what? Thanksgiving with thanksgiving. Those are very powerful words. Why are they powerful? Because they change my whole outlook on prayer from one of reactive, God just change this, to all of a sudden one of of maybe a bit more proactive. Let me explain. If I make my prayers in sort of a reactive way, somewhat of a defensive way, my heart attitude is probably going to be something like this. Again, God, I don't like this. I'm not in control, so fix it, please, so I can be comfortable again. But if my prayer requests and supplications are coupled with thanksgiving, watch what happens. Father, thank you for always working in my life. Thank you for always working for my good. Lord, I don't know why this thing is happening. And Lord, this is a very difficult thing, but I trust you're in control of it. And I trust that you love me. And I trust that you want what's best for me. And I trust that you're allowing me, Lord, to face this. So thank you for allowing me to face it. Now, Father, here's my prayer requests. You see the difference? That reactive and defensive prayer is always aimed at trying to align God with 
my will, right? God, change this. But a more thankful prayer is really about aligning my will with God's. God, I trust you. Help me to see what you're doing. It doesn't mean I can't ask God for specific things, but in my thanksgiving, I'm going to automatically have this posture of believing that God is good and that he's going to answer it according to his will. His sovereign will, mind you. He's always in control. But his good will. So I want to encourage you with this this morning, church. We've been studying the book of Philippians for the last several months. There's been a lot of uh, ongoing themes that we've, we've looked at and kind of driven home. One of the key ones was in chapter 1, verse 27, where Paul says, live your lives in a manner worthy of the gospel of Jesus Christ, right? And so over and over, we've come back to that statement and said, what, what's he driving at here? He wants us to be gospel-focused. He wants us to live according to what's true about the gospel. Let my life be a reflection of what's true about the gospel, I think we can say that this is what he's doing here in these verses in chapter 4. Live in a way where you're, you're not anxious about things, but in prayer you're going to the Lord believing him to be good, believing what's true about the gospel. Be thankful for who he is and what he's done in your life. So can I just walk you back through some of the things that we've looked at here in Philippians to remind us all of what we can be thankful for, here's what we can be thankful mostly for. We have been given such a great salvation. We have everything we need. Look back at chapter one. Let me just walk you through some things and hopefully we'll gain some fresh understanding here. Chapter one, verse six. Paul says, I am sure of this, that he who began a good work in you will bring it to completion at the day of Jesus Christ. Chapter 1, verse 21, for to me, to live is Christ, and to die is gain. Chapter 1, verse 27, only let your manner of life be worthy of the gospel of Christ, so that whether I come and see you or am absent, I may hear of you that you are standing firm in one spirit with one mind, striving side by side for the faith of the gospel and not frightened in anything by your opponents. This is a clear sign to them of their destruction, but of your salvation and that from God. Chapter 2, verse 5, have this mind among yourselves, which is yours in Christ Jesus, who though he was in the form of God, did not count equality with God a thing to be grasped, but he made himself nothing, taking the form of a bondservant, being born in the likeness of men, and being found in human form, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. Therefore, God has highly exalted him and bestowed on him the name that is above every name, so that the name of Jesus, every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. And that's the Jesus we pray to. Chapter 2, verse 13, for it is God who works in you both to will and to work for his good pleasure. Chapter 3, verse 7, whatever gain I had, I counted as loss for the sake of Christ. Indeed, I count everything as loss because of the surpassing worth of knowing Christ Jesus my Lord. For his sake, I've suffered the loss of all things, and I count them as rubbish in order that I might gain Christ. And be found in him, not having a righteousness of my own that comes from the law, but that which comes through faith in Christ. The righteousness from God that depends on faith, that I may know him and the power of his resurrection and may share in his sufferings, 
becoming like him in his death, that by any means possible I may attain the resurrection from the dead. Do you see all of these gospel promises that we've been taught already in the book of Philippians that should cause us to be able to look at God and say, God, you are God. Jesus, you are Lord. My salvation in you is certain. What should I be afraid of? When we live in a state of anxiety, it's, it's like we're saying, God, I don't believe you're sovereign. I don't believe you're good. I don't believe I can trust you. I don't believe all these promises that you've made are really for me. God's not telling you not to get anxious ever. That would be impossible for a sinful human being like us. He's asking you, though, when you do, cast your anxieties on him. Cast them on him. Not simply with a, a blind faith, but really believing. Really trusting the truth of his sovereign plan to work all things out for the good of those who love him through the gospel promises of his word. You need to remember the truth. We need to remember the truth. And we'll remember it by being thankful. Doing what we just did. Stopping, pausing, thanking, reminding ourselves. Ah, God, yes, yes. You're good. I can trust you. And then what happens when we do that? You know what happens? Paul gives us a wonderful promise here in verse 7. Remember what he said? And the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. I know some of you have had some really difficult months, weeks, days, years, I know 2022 was very challenging for some of you. But here's what God is saying to you. I want to give you peace. I want to give you a peace that goes way beyond what you can even comprehend. Your finite minds can't handle the kind of peace that God has stored up in his being to pour out upon his people. Isn't that a wonderful promise? Peace that surpasses understanding. A peace that will guard my heart, that can guard my mind in Christ Jesus. What is it doing? It's guarding what I believe and what I feel with what's true. This is who God is. This is what he's done for you, and this is who you are in him. Peace. It's the polar opposite of anxiety. We've got to come to God in prayer. And we have to come to him with a prayer that's guided by the truth of who we are and what we have in him. By the way, I didn't read verses 8 and 9, but that's exactly what those verses affirm. Finally, brothers, whatever is true, whatever is honorable, whatever is just, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is commendable, if there's any excellence, if there's anything worthy of praise, think about these things. What you've learned and received and heard and seen in me, practice these things, and the God of peace will be with you. Remember the truth of the gospel. So what are you worried about this morning? What are you worried about? Take it to Jesus. Come to the cross. Remind yourself of what the cross represents and find there the power to overcome the sin that separates us from God. The freedom to turn our back on anxiety, 
and the power of his resurrection to raise us to new life in peace with him. I want to just give you three encouragements uh, to go, three bits of application. I, I mean, it's, it's just an outflow of what I've just said. But I, I hope as a church family, we'll do a good job of encouraging one another and supporting one another in pursuing that kind of prayerful, truth-driven, peaceful lives this year. So here's my commitment to you. I'm going to, in our email bulletin that goes out this Wednesday, and Ashley's going to remind me to do this. Ashley, write this down. I'm going to, I'm going to include some ways that will help you be in the Word this year. If we need to be reminded by the truth, one of the best ways to do that is to be in the Word regularly. And by regularly, I hope daily. And there's some plans that exist that will help you do that. Sometimes that's a very intimidating thing. I know many of you, your New Year's resolution is I want to read through my Bible this year, and then you get to Leviticus somewhere in you know, February and you, and you quit, right? Um, it's, it can be challenging to do that, but there are some plans that are in place that can help you do that, and there's some creativity in some of those plans that help keep it fresh, so I'm going to commit to giving you some helpful tools in the email this week that will help you engage in God's Word, all right? So that's the first thing. The second thing is I really want to encourage you, pray this year pray don't make that into something bigger than it needs to be in terms of an obligation in your life prayer should never be an obligation prayer should be the recognition that my father in heaven loves me and wants to commune with me so talk to him talk to him learn to bring your requests to him learn to lay your anxieties on him and we need to encourage one another to do that. So I'm asking us as the family of God here, support one another. Ask each other questions. What's going on with you? How can I pray with you? How's your prayer life going? Encourage one another. Don't turn it into a measuring stick of righteousness. Just encourage one another to pray. And trust that God will answer big prayers this year. And the third thing I want to lay out for you, and you might think this is a, a, a bit of a, a strange application here, but it's this, is, is I want to encourage church membership. If you're a believer and you're not yet a part of the church as an official member of the congregation, you may think, well, what has that got to do with anything? That's just an affiliation, right? No, it's not. It's a covenant relationship. It is a commitment to do exactly what I've just described, to say to one another, I am your brother, you are my sister, we are recognized as a part of the same family of faith, and so we have an obligation and a responsibility to walk with each other, to help each other pursue Christ, to come along and bear each other's burdens and pray for one another. That's what church membership is about. It's an affirmation of our responsibility to care for each other. So we have a membership class that's coming up in two Sundays, and I'd encourage you to RSVP and come and be a part of that. And if you're already a church member, dive more deeply into that covenant commitment. Take it seriously. Let's love one another well. But the whole point is this. We have a God who is good and sovereign, whom we can trust, and he's made promises to us. Are we depending on him? And if we do that, 2023 with all of its challenges and it will have plenty could still be a year full of peace let's pray father again i thank you for your word just thank you for this reminder we need this reminder i need this reminder every day i need this reminder that you are in control that you're good that jesus came and he died for my sins and he rose again and he advocates for me now that I have a certain hope that even though this world and my life will have trials and tribulations, I will not be left alone. And I have a promise, a confident promise that you're going to complete the work you began in me and that you're going to take me home. And all of us in Christ have those same promises. And so we thank you. 
And we pray that you'd help us to remain thankful so that we'll remain in communion with you, rooted in those truths, prayerful and trusting. God, would you grant the peace that surpasses understanding? And I pray especially for those of my brothers and sisters who in this room this morning have had really hard, uh, a really hard year. Father, overwhelm them with a peace that surpasses understanding. You are our God and we are your people. Thank you for this confident hope. And Lord, bless our 2023. Make this a year of renewal. Make this a year of deepened trust and faith in you. And make us a people who then reflect that to the world around us. Oh, what confidence they have. What hope do they have? May our hope be known to be in Jesus. We pray that in his name.